Welcome to this next session of Leaders Following. We're on a journey together exploring the biblical foundations of true leadership that is truly Christian. My name is George Miley. I'll be our host as we move along. But Jesus of Nazareth, the greatest leader ever to live, will be our teacher. In our last session, we looked at the subject of leadership reproduction. We looked at the quotation that said, good leaders create followers, but great leaders create leaders. Jesus had three years in which to establish a movement that would alter history. How did he go about doing it? He began by choosing and developing and reproducing himself in those who would give leadership to this movement. How leaders reproduce new leaders is the subject of chapter 16 of Leaders Following. Jesus began his process of reproducing leaders for his movement by calling them. We look at the Gospels, and Jesus actually begins all on his own. And then one of the first things he does is call others, disciples, into his leadership training program. A life lived fulfilling the purposes of God, fulfilled in walking out God's calling, is incredibly fulfilling. But it is also terribly costly. It will be strongly opposed by Satan. Volunteers will quit. Something deeper and more profound is needed to be called by God. Every leader can expect to come to a point of feeling a strong desire to quit. This is just too much. How do we keep going? The inescapable conviction that God has called us is what allows us to endure. Calling is the subject of chapter 17 in Leaders Following. Before we go any further, I wonder if you would pause with me that we might be able to pray together and commit this time to the Lord. Lord Jesus, you call disciples and you're calling people today you're calling some of us. We pray that you will give us understanding of what it means to be called by God. Come, Holy Spirit, and illuminate our understanding in our time together now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus spoke of John the Baptist. I think these are powerful words. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken in the wind? That's kind of the definition of a volunteer. A reed shaken in the wind. Did you go out in the wilderness to see a reed shaken in the wind? John had sent his disciples to ask Jesus, Are you the one that is to come, or shall we look for another? Was that discouragement in John? He had previously identified Jesus as the Messiah. Remember that? Jesus said, look, this is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. John was no reed shaken in the wind. He had stood unbent before spiritual storms, the rigors of wilderness life, the opposition of Jewish leaders, the fury of Herod, John knew his calling had been prophetically foretold. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, as the prophet Isaiah has said. But can someone be called by God and then later have doubts? What does it actually mean to be called by God? So let's begin our investigation of that question by talking about God's call generally to mankind. 
Is there a general calling that God has given to all human beings? And it turns out we see it right in the beginning of Scripture in Genesis 1. God said, let us make man or human beings in our own image and let them have dominion. So God created men and women and gave to us the responsibility of exercising dominion over his creation. A good place to begin to understand God's call upon individual people is to consider his calling for mankind in general. God created human beings to have dominion. Now, what does it mean to have dominion? Another way to think about it in more simple terms is to rule. God has called us to be rulers, all of us. This may be particularly relevant for those called by God to lead. So those of us called to lead with a specific calling and gifting to lead, lead in a more accentuated way. But God has assigned each person our own unique role in the governance of his world. Now, there are four related principles that are connected with exercising dominion. So let's look at four principles that kind of help to bring this into clarity for us. What is involved in exercising dominion? Number one, we exercise dominion in harmony with God. So the whole idea that we have been called to have dominion, we've been called to rule, is not to be interpreted that we go off and do our own thing or we promote our own ego. No, we are called to have dominion under the overall dominion of God. Our kingdom only works properly when it is integrated with God's kingdom. We exercise dominion under God. Now, as we go through some of this, those of you who have been with us in previous sessions of Leaders Following will recognize some themes that we have already looked into. For example, submission. So a foundational characteristic of biblical leadership is the ability to submit. We don't usually associate leadership with submission, except that we think others should submit to the leader. But actually, the leader must have submission woven in and formed into his or her character before he's ready to really be effective in exercising dominion. We exercise our dominion in submission to God, under God's dominion. The disasters of human history stem from the fact that from the beginning, we have chosen to exercise dominion apart from God on our own. Now, if you look around the world today, the nations, the political arena, the business arena, the church, you will see multiple dysfunction that is triggered by human beings exercising their own dominion in self-centeredness and self-will apart from God. As the action of God's grace transforms self-centeredness into God-centeredness, remember our chapter on spiritual formation? So as we allow God to work his grace in us, what God's grace and the power of God's grace does, it transforms self-centeredness into God-centeredness. In that way, we learn to rule in harmony with God. This leads to the healing of individuals and whole societies. Leaders submitting their dominion to the dominion of God. Okay, the second principle we exercise dominion in harmony with the dominion of others. So as I exercise my dominion, it's not only in submission to God, but it's also in submission to you. Because you also have been called of God to exercise dominion. 
We are members of an interconnected human community. We're not alone individuals. We're part of a family. We're part of a neighborhood. We're part of a society. We're part of a culture. We're part of a people. We're part of a country. We are interconnected. And each one of us is to fulfill his or her God-given role. None of us is able to exercise effective dominion alone. So the people who want to go off and do it on their own will end up in disaster. Our ruling will be, must be integrated with the ruling of others. To govern effectively, love must govern us. God is love. What does it mean for God to govern me? It means love governs me. And when love governs me, I'm able to rule effectively. When self-centeredness governs me, I'm going to malfunction. Here again is the foundational role of character in governing or leading. Selfish ambition is destructive. Effective ruling. What is effective ruling? It is serving others, loving others, that their highest good may be attained. Listen to the words of Paul. If all we had was this verse. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count other people more significant than yourselves. Philippians 2.3. Wow. Okay, principle number three. What does it mean for us to exercise dominion? We exercise dominion by using our spiritual gifts. Effective governance in God's work develops as I express my spiritual gifts in harmony with the spiritual gifts of others. Now, we're going to deal more extensively with spiritual gifts in a future session of Leaders Following, so we won't go into this in any more detail here. But my spiritual gifts must flow in harmony with your spiritual gifts, and that is why right in the middle of his dealing with spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 12 to 1 Corinthians 14, Paul puts the, the, the chapter 13 on love. Principle number four in exercising dominion. We exercise dominion by preparing to rule with Christ in eternity. Now, I think this is such an important understanding that the Lord wants us all to have. We are being trained by the Lord to govern, to exercise dominion, to rule, but it doesn't stop when our life here on earth is over. God is preparing us to rule with him, to have dominion with him into eternity. Listen to this these words from Revelation 22. His servants will worship him and they will reign with him forever and ever. Discipleship is training for reigning. So as we learn to have dominion now, we are being prepared for reigning with him forever. Okay. Now let's move to this question. What does it mean to be called by God? So that's a legitimate question. People hear about God's call and they can wonder, has God called me? How do I know? What should I listen for? And there can be confusing messages that come to us. So let's try to see if we can bring some clarity to that. And I'd like to share with you five ways or five um, facts about what it means to be called by God. Here's the first one. To be called by God means a growing awareness that God has chosen me for a specific purpose. A growing awareness. It might be dramatic, 
But more often than not, it's not all that dramatic. It's a process. It's a growing understanding that God has called me for something specific. It's an understanding that develops. And as it develops, it begins to shape my life choices. So that's the first principle. The second principle, it means being willing to be led into the unknown. So here we go. Are we ready for the unknown? Think of the biblical examples. Abraham, God led him into the unknown. Leave your family, leave your father's house, leave the land that you were born in and go to a land. What land, Lord? The land that I will show you. Moses. God appears to Moses, go into Egypt, tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Lord, Pharaoh's not going to listen to me. This question, that question, the other question. God was leading him into the unknown. Um, Daniel, as a young man taken into captivity in Babylon, uh, what is that going to involve? What is that going to require of me? Throughout Christian history, calling of God inevitably leads us into the unknown. Now, why is that? Let me tell you why it is. Because it is dangerous for us to know too much in advance. <laughs> if God were to tell us too much in advance, we would be tempted to put our hands to it. Okay, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. So I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do the other thing. And all of a sudden, we're taking charge. God doesn't allow us to do that. He calls us into the unknown. We say, Lord, what about this? What about that? What about the other thing? And the Lord says, trust me, look to me, walk with me day by day, hour by hour, moment by moment. I'm leading you but I'm not going to tell you too much in advance. It's not good for you. Um, there will be uncertainty and vulnerability. What if this doesn't work? What if I fail? Responding to God's call will involve trusting him moment by moment. Point number three, it means a readiness to suffer. There will be satanic attacks. There would be opposition from unbelievers. There will be misunderstanding with co-workers. There will be disappointments. There will be setbacks. It will be hard. It won't be easy sailing. It won't be all joy and peace and wonder. Satan is attacking and opposing God's work, and he will attack and oppose those who are called of God. We have to be ready to carry that in the Lord's strength. In Damascus, Ananias was sent to confirm God's call to Saul. Remember that? Jesus appeared to Saul on the road to Damascus. God called Ananias to go and confirm that. And God said to Ananias, I will show him, Paul, how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Self-centeredness is a primary cause of leadership, ineffectiveness, and failure. Suffering, we've already seen this in previous sessions, suffering is actually a gift of God's grace. In what way? Suffering responded to correctly delivers us from the self-life and leads us into a deep, beautiful, life-transforming, fulfilling experience of life with God. Okay, principle number four. Being called of God means that my choices have meaningful consequences. Faithfulness to my calling results in blessing for many. So when God calls us, He's not just thinking about us. He's thinking about all those that he is going to bless as we respond to his call, live out his call, 
allow him to work through us to bring blessing to many. Unfaithfulness to God's call results in loss and damage. Listen to the words of Jesus. Everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. So being called of God is actually a serious consequential experience. Our choices will lead to the blessing of many or the loss of blessing for many. Okay, number five. It means a life of unspeakable fulfillment and joy. So suffering, yes. Uncertainty, yes. Challenges, yes, all that. But it means something superseding that, overwhelming that, overshadowing that. A life of unspeakable fulfillment and joy. Beyond the cost, a life spent walking with God in his calling is the most fulfilling life imaginable. Listen to these words from Paul written at the end of his life to Timothy. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. So Paul looked death in the face and gave incredible thanks to God for the gift of God's calling to him. Okay, next question. How can I know God has called me? So let me share three ways that we can know God has called us. The first way is the still, small voice. The still, small voice. God's call to the boy Samuel provides helpful insights into how God speaks. And we read about this in 1 Samuel 3. One might expect God's voice to be loud and dramatic. <laughs> Actually, he typically prefers to speak softly and gently. Why is that? Why doesn't God speak more boldly, more clearly, more loudly, more inescapably? Why is that? God speaks in ways that allow us to resist. He is not interested in forcing his will. Our response must be our own decision, and this often takes time. So having said that, maybe I should be a little bit autobiographical, autobiographical with you now. One of the experiences I had with God's call was actually God speaking in very dramatic ways. I was in theological seminary, and I was a good student. I actually had been elected chaplain of the student body. And I was preparing to go on with to get a doctorate. And I had dreams of having a big theological library, studies, becoming well-known, becoming famous. I had all those dreams. Parallel to all that, inside of me there was a deep hunger for more of God. I wanted more of God. My relationship with God was not what I wanted it to be. It was shallow. It was superficial. Yes, I was studying the Bible. Yes, I was doing prayer. But there, was, there were foundational things in me that, were, that resulted in my relationship with God being superficial. And in the midst of all of that, God spoke to me. And he spoke to me in unescapable ways. And he said, George, I want you to leave the studies. It's not that the studies are bad, but it's that that's not what you need. You don't need more Greek and Hebrew and theology. What you need is to take what I've already given you and begin to put it into practice. 
And so I made the decision not to continue my studies. That was costly. My family didn't understand. My professors didn't understand. And I ended up in the villages of India. I wanted to be unknown. I wanted to know Jesus. I wanted to walk with Jesus. I wanted to serve the people in the villages of India. And that was the one of the most transforming experiences in my whole life. That is what I needed. God called me out of an environment in which I was too weak to really spiritually be uh, vital and call me into settings where he could form me in the way he wanted me to go. So there is no doubt in my mind whatsoever that God spoke to me in that situation in very, very strong ways. But I needed him to speak to me in strong ways. So we're not ruling that out. The Lord called to Samuel three times. Each time Samuel thought Eli was calling him. He was hearing, but not yet fully accurately. Remember that? God spoke to Samuel. Samuel thought Eli was calling him. He went to Eli. Did you call me? No, I didn't call you. Go back to sleep. Three times. After hearing God speak, we can tend to second guess, to doubt, to question whether this was really God. Was this just my imagination? When God speaks, but we find ourselves uncertain, we can simply wait in his presence with humble, open hearts for confirmation. In time, clarity will come. So I've already given you an example of the strong voice of God. Let me give you an example of the quiet voice of God. And something we're going to talk about in a minute also the fact that God's call tends to unfold as we go along with different dimensions. So let me just give you, um, again, a little autobiographical um, report from my own experience. Six years ago, Hannah and I, together with many other beloved brothers and sisters, came to the end of an initiative called Wittenberg 2017. It was an initiative focused on the unity of the body of Christ through confession and repentance, grieving together, forgiving one another, coming together in the presence of the Lord. It was beautiful. It was wonderful. And Hannah and I kind of thought, you know, this is probably the end for us. You know, we're getting older. Lo and behold, quite unexpectedly to us, God opened up a whole new season of ministry after that. That was six years ago. Now, I'm 83 and Hannah's 91. You'd think that would be the end. My understanding and sense is that a year ago now, God began to call us into a whole new season of ministry. I may be wrong about that. How am I responding? Waiting upon God, trusting him to unfold what's really from him. I will tell you that in the last year, my wife has been filmed seven times to tell her story. None of these did she seek. This wasn't anybody's marketing plan. And also, this year, I have been recording these sessions in Leaders Following. We didn't plan that. And all of that is going to have effects. What are going to be the effects of Hannah being filmed seven times? What, what's going to be the impact of that? What's going to be the impact of this series? I don't know that. It feels like God is opening up, even at our ages, a whole new area of ministry. I may be wrong on that. How to respond? Wait upon God. Trust God. When God speaks, but we find ourselves uncertain, we can simply wait in his presence with humble, open hearts for confirmation. In time, clarity will come. 
Okay, next point. The affirmation of wise counselors. How do I know God has called me? Wise counselors. Listen to the words of Paul to Timothy. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you. Paul is affirming Timothy in the calling Timothy had received. So let's talk just for a minute about affirmation. And when we talk about affirmation, we need to kind of talk also about flattery, two very different things. What is affirmation? Affirmation is a powerful instrument in leadership. So we leaders need to understand how powerful affirmation is. It must be used carefully and insightfully. Affirmation is an expression of love. Affirmation is speaking to a person that which is true, that which is honoring, that which is respectful, that which is encouraging. Affirmation, expression of love. Flattery is saying things to another person that are exaggerated or untrue. Flattery is manipulative. If I flatter another person, I'm saying things that are extreme or untrue, trying to manipulate that person to do what I want them to do. Affirmation is free of that. I'm not trying to get the person to do anything. I'm expressing love to the person and respect to the person. So the affirmation of wise counselors. So what a beautiful thing it is for us to be able to go to wise counselors and say to them, this is my understanding of what God may be saying to me, how God may be calling me. What are your thoughts? What counsel would you give? Would you pray with me for God's clear guidance? So the beauty and the gift of the affirmation of wise counselors. And this immediately gets us into, we won't spend a lot of time talking about this, but the beautiful honoring role of mentors and the beautiful honoring role of spiritual fathers and mothers. May God bring many of them into our lives to serve as wise counselors and those who give protection. Now, another way I know God is calling me is God's sovereign arranging of circumstances. Now, let's talk just for a minute about Paul. Here are the words from Acts chapter 9. But the Lord said to him, to Ananias, Go, for Paul is a chosen instrument of mine, to do what? To carry my name before the Gentiles, before kings, and before the children of Israel. Well, that's, that's a big calling. That's a broad calling. The Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. But God had already prepared Paul for this. There was a sovereign preparation before this road to Damascus experience ever happened. In what way? Paul was, to begin with, a Jew of the diaspora. He was a Jew, but he didn't live in Jerusalem. And because he was a Jew of the diaspora, he was born and grew up among Gentiles. He understood Gentile language. He understood Gentile culture. He understood the Gentiles. And so God called him to be a messenger to the Gentiles. He understood their social and cultural context. Secondly, Paul was a Roman citizen by birth. That wasn't Paul's plan. That was God's sovereign putting into place preparation for the purposes and the call that God had for Paul. Three, Paul was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. So not only was he Jewish born among the Gentiles, but actually he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews with an impeccable Jewish identity. Four, he was educated by Gamaliel. Gamaliel was the most prominent rabbi of his time. And five, he was well known to the Jewish elite. As God's call on our life gradually unfolds, we typically discover multiple ways by which he has already sovereignly prepared us. 
So is God calling you? I believe God is calling many of you. How is he calling you? However he is calling you, you can be sure of this. He has sovereignly prepared the circumstances of your life for the calling that he has for you. Okay, one more um, large topic and then we're through. How do I know what specifically God is calling me to do? So we've talked up to now about calling in a general way, but how do I know specifically what I'm called to do? Two ways I know. First of all, begin to minister. Begin to minister, begin to minister. Calling and gifting go together. God gives gifts to enable us to fulfill his calling. The gifts that God has given me point to the way he has called me. So what gifts do I have? Again, we're going to talk more about gifts later on in another session. How do I know what gifts God has given me? Start ministry. And the things that you do that bring fulfillment and spiritual fruit are the areas most likely in which God has gifted you. Okay, begin to minister. Two, watch how understanding how God has called me expands. God's sovereign arrangement of circumstances will play a pivotal role through people I meet and opportunities that present themselves. So we talked about God's arranging of circumstances. Who are the people God is bringing me into contact with? And how is God opening up opportunities for me to move into? This process of discernment carried out over time, perhaps years, confirms not only what I'm called to do, but also what I'm not called to do. So let me give you another. I'm talking to you about my own journey here. Uh, let me just give you another example that pops in my mind as I read that. There was a time some years ago when I had a fairly major ministry role in my local church. I wasn't on staff, just a member of the congregation, but the leadership um, asked me to teach. And many other ways, I was involved in active leadership in our local congregation. That is no longer the case. Hannah and I, it's still our church family. We love going there. We love the people that are there. But the ministry in the local congregation has moved on now to the next generation. We rejoice in that. So there's been a change in circumstances that are affecting our ministry. Now you may say, well, George, how sad that is that you don't have anything to do anymore. <laughs> it's, it's not that we don't have anything to do. We have more to do than that. We have more to do than we have energy to do. So God has brought something to an end. And in the meanwhile, he's opening up all kind of new doors. In my ministry with Antioch Network, I have now, I'm no longer a member of the board. The next generation of leaders are carrying the work forward. I couldn't be more thankful and happy about that. But wow, in the midst of all that, the Lord is opening more and more opportunities uh, to minister. Paul was called. So this process of discernment carried out over time. Just said it. Let me repeat it for myself. Involves me understanding not only what I'm called to do, but what I'm called not to do. Paul was called to an apostolic ministry among Gentiles. Peter was called to an apostolic ministry among Jews. Paul's assignment became more specific. Remember in Acts 16? Acts 16 tells us how Paul and his team were forbidden to speak the word in Asia or Bithynia. They wanted to go to Asia and Bithynia. The Holy Spirit stopped them. Why did the Holy Spirit stop them? 
It wasn't that Asia and Bithynia, Bithynia didn't need the gospel. They did. But God had other people that he would call there. God was calling Paul and his team to Macedonia to take the gospel for the first time into Europe. Years later, Paul wrote his letter to the church in Rome. Again, we see his sense of God's assignment gaining further focus. So we're coming to the end here. But this is one of my favorite. I just love this chapter, Romans 15. If you want, the next session that we're going to do is on apostolic calling. Romans 15, to me, it's just a beautiful chapter to talk about that calling. Listen to these words of Paul. Romans 15. But now, he's writing to Rome, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions. In other words, Paul is saying, you know, there's nothing more for me to do here. Really? <laughs> Can you imagine anyone with the gift of pastor saying that? There's no more for me to do. Can't you see that this marriage is in trouble? Can't you see that this person is in trouble? Can't you see that the church is in trouble? Can't you see all these needs around you? But it was God's calling for others to care for those needs. That wasn't God, God's call to Paul. God's call to Paul was to initiate new works. And so as he wrote to the Romans, he's saying, you know, there's nothing more for me to do around here. I have longed for many years to come to you. I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and be helped on my journey there by you. Once I have enjoyed your company for a while, at present I'm going to Jerusalem. So here Paul is writing, look, I'm going to Spain. When I get to Spain, I'm going to visit. Well, on my way to Spain, I want to visit you. First, I'm going to Jerusalem, but there's no more things for me to do here. So I'm off. What are we seeing here? We're seeing a growing focus in God's call upon Paul's life. Again, we see the relationship between calling and gifting. Paul was called and gifted to pioneer new works. To shepherd these new works was the calling of others. So what are we saying? As we begin to move in God's calling, be ready for God to bring new phases, new understandings, new open doors, new things that we never dreamed about. God is calling us to new things. But we must learn to walk with him step by step. To more fully understand what we just said about Paul's calling, it will be helpful to spend some time considering the New Testament teaching on apostolic ministry. Let's do that in the next chapter. You know, friends, I'm looking forward to this. We've talked about calling, but the role of what we understand to be apostolic calling is so crucial and central in the whole process of the growth of the kingdom of God throughout the earth. We want to take a look at that in our next session. I hope you'll be with us. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the awesome reality of your calling, the mystery of your calling. We are unworthy, but you have chosen us and called us. We entrust now this teaching to you. Use it for your glory. Guide us as we continue to move along in our exploration of authentic biblical leadership. We pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.